remarkable, distinguished, extraordinary? Does our language have an adjective that fully defines a man of Dr. Clifton Wharton's accomplishment? You be the judge. Advisor to six presidents of the United States, the first African-American chairman and CEO of a Fortune 100 enterprise, a top State Department diplomat, the first African-American president of a major research university. Any one of these titles alone earns our admiration, our respect, and our praise. And together, they tell us much of the story of Clifton Wharton. As you know, Dr. Wharton has recently published his memoir, Privilege and Prejudice, The Life of a Black Pioneer. I confess that I'm only halfway through and I asked him not to quiz me on the second half yet. In a few moments, we'll learn more about his career and his life, including his years here at BLS, when he is joined here on stage by another esteemed legend of this institution, Headmaster Emeritus Michael Conopasis. Before we get to that, I'd like to ask you to join me in congratulating Dr. Wharton on an honor he does not expect, but which we are privileged to bestow upon this man who has brought such honor to our school. Today, we immortalize the Wharton name by adding it to the lower frieze of our esteemed assembly hall. So I'd like to invite Dr. Wharton and Mrs. Wharton to join me, please. It's not just a flag hung up for decoration. So if you could come over. Congratulations. Dr. Warden indicated that he's speechless, but I hope he finds his speech because at this time we would like to invite him and Mr. Conopasis here to join us on stage to discuss his memoir. Dr. Clifton Warden and Mr. Michael Conopasis, please. Cliff, I've got to tell you that uh, Peter and Lynn knew that I was coming down to see you and Dolores on Monday last, and they swore me to secrecy that I shouldn't say a word about what just took place, but well deserved. Lynn mentioned a lot of Dr. Wharton's fame and good works. We're going to talk a lot about that during the course of the hour that we have. Uh, as Bill Moyer once said, he's been a quiet pioneer and a pioneer in many, many areas. But like all very esteemed and successful folk, there's always been someone by his side. And she happens to be with us this morning. A distinguished career in her own right I jotted down a few things that this wonderful lady has accomplished. A member of the trustees or the board of directors of the following, the Kellogg Corporation, Phillips Petroleum, New York Telephone, Gannett, the Albany Law School. She's been on the board of visitors at Tulane, the board of governors at MIT, patron of the arts, and an entrepreneur who very early on established a not-for-profit in which the goal was to train individuals to take on positions of responsibility. That as being first lady at Michigan State, at SUNY, and at TIA CREF. Ted Hesburgh has written 
a, in his preface in the book that you will all uh, have access to, that Dolores Wharton has been an important dimension of the Cliff Wharton story. They have been a husband and wife, as he mentions, that cast a single shadow. Please give a hearty Boston Latin School welcome to Mrs. Dolores Wharton. In thinking about how would we start this, obviously uh, Cliff has done a number of these and we're fortunate that he asked to come to Latin school to do, I believe this is the last one, is it not? And when you think about his time at Latin school, it's been 72 years since he left this auditorium as a graduate. There are folks here from the class of 43. Bill Nyan is here. Mike Simon is here. Ben Sobel is here. Alvin Pierce is here. And one of the two Hennessys is here. And I don't know where Bill is, but Cliff, you told me there was a big Hennessy and a little Hennessy. <laughs> Which one is the one that's here? Is he the little Hennessy? Yeah. That's not the problem. The problem is usually there were five Cohens. And the five Cohens. He's a little, <laughs> <laughs> He's a little <laughs> Anderson. And I might add a very distinguished yes, principal yeah. for many, many years in the Boston Public Schools. Welcome to you all. So let's begin. 72 years, long time. Tell us a little bit about the experiences that you have talked about in the book leading up to your coming to, I believe, the Nathan Hale for a short period of time, the Higginson for a short period of time, and then coming to Boston Latin School. So if you, let's start off with the early history, if we can. I'll be glad to. Uh, before I do that, I want to, first of all, thank uh, Boston Latin School, Headmaster Tata, and Peter Kelly for this. This is uh, a totally unexpected, and I'm, I'm really speechless. It's, uh, it's an honor that uh, is something that is very, very close to my heart. It just is, I can't tell you about it. I think uh, Mike would like me to talk a little bit about how I became a student here at Boston Latin. Um, and you will notice in the book, uh, my father was a career diplomat. And in his own way, he was a black pioneer as well. Uh, he was the first black to pass the U.S. Foreign Service examination. Uh, when he took the exam, um, there was at that time created the Foreign Service Institute, which was to train new diplomats in the arts of diplomacy. But Washington was segregated, and my father was the first, and the State Department did not want him to enroll in that Foreign Service Institute. But uh, as a result, the State Department, in its great wisdom, decreed that my father had already taken the course and gave him a diploma. <laughs> and then they sent him off to Africa. And you will find in the book that uh, in Africa, this was where I was created, which is an interesting story. But I was born in Boston, not too far from here, when it was used to be bar lying in hospital up here. And um, I joined my parents abroad in Africa, in Liberia, and in the Canary Islands of Spain. And during that period of time, during that period of time, uh, there were no international schools, no American schools. All you had were correspondence courses. And so my mother enrolled me in a correspondence course. Now keep in mind, this was in the 1920s, 1930s, I'm sorry. And in order for me to get a lesson, they came by ship. There was no commercial airlines. So my lessons would come out by ship for two weeks. I would take my studies, take the exam, and would come back to, the school, to school in the United States. They'd grade it, and then come back. 
and I'd get my grades. That's long distance learning in those days. <laughs> but this was the process by which I was taught. In that process, my mother was very instrumental in always including in my studies something which was not in the curriculum. She insisted that I learn about outstanding historically black uh, Indian blacks in the United States, all the distinguished figures, all the way from Frederick Douglass all the way down. And she always included my father in the list because he was so outstanding. Well, the time came when they decided that I needed to become Americanized. Uh, by that time, I was bilingual in Spanish, spent my childhood all abroad, and they thought that I should become a little more of an American. So they sent me back to the United States and to live with my grandmother. Now, in the interim, during one previous period, when I came back on home leave, this is the one that uh, Mike is referring to. Uh, I went to school and I was tested. And Bill Hennessy will appreciate this, that when they tested me, I was, I think it was seventh grade geography, eighth grade reading, second grade math, you know, about the good average student. And uh, they finally put me in the fourth grade. And in the first class, the teacher who knew that I was from abroad and had come from abroad, decided that to put me at ease, and she knew that I read very well, she would have me correct any student who made a mistake in his reading. <laughs> so a student would make a mistake and she'd call on me Clifton and I'd stand up and I'd read it properly. During recess, <laughs> I should also explain that in going to the school, my mother said to me, she said, Clifton, you may hear words that you've never heard before. I don't want you to use any of those words until you check them with me. <laughs> All right. So I came home and my mother said that I had every single curse word in the magical. And she was saying, don't use that word, don't use that word. Don't. And I said, screw. And she said, you mean like with a piece of wood? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and she said, don't use that word. And then I said, well, there was a boy who came up to me in recess. And he says, you think you're smart, but you're just a nigger. And I never heard the word before. So I said to my mother, that's what he told me. And she said, Clifton, she said, that's the way in which a white person wants to demean you by categorizing you as a negative person who is lesser. He's putting you into that box. I don't ever want you to let anyone put you into that box. And that lesson lasted for the rest of my life. So I came back with my grandmother, and I enrolled in uh, Higginson, along with my good friend who's here, Cord Ellis. And uh, it was in those days, for those of you who are not familiar with that period, Boston had absolutely wonderful primary schools all over the city of Boston. It made no difference whether it was upper income, lower income, they were great schools. And from Higginson, the teacher and the principal decided that I should go to Boston Latin School. So I was admitted and came to Boston Latin School. And I remember very clearly coming in here on the first orientation with the rest of my classes, some of them whom as you heard are here today. But this experience for me at Boston Latin was one of the most critical ones in my life. In those days, the values and systems were slightly different than they are today. In those days, as one of the alumni used to say, Boston Latin School was an equal opportunity fire. They would get rid of you if you were no good, I mean, just like that. And in my class, of those who entered, only 42% graduated. That was the way they approached it. Today, it's a little different because you want everybody to succeed to graduate. But in my day, no. You either made it or you didn't. And it was just like that. I had some absolutely marvelous teachers, masters, really, many of them. Uh, among them, of course, uh, in one of the speeches that I gave here, which was well received, was, the, uh, was Roach. <laughs> now, 
See, there's not as much laughter this time. There are not, yeah. not that many people who know Roach here. I, I've got to interrupt here for one reason, and that is that many of us who came after Cliff have a far different <laughs> impression of Bill Roach, alias Doc Roach, <laughs> than Cliff has. In fact, when we have chatted over the last six months, one of the things that Cliff told me about, which I couldn't believe, as a story that he will tell you about, yeah, about well, Bill Roach. What happened was very simple. I'd been with my grandmother for three years while my parents were abroad. And my mother came back with my siblings. And of course, she checked me out. And my mother had taught uh, Latin. Keep in mind that my father had gone from English high to law school, skipping undergraduate. And my mother had gone from girls high to BU to study chemistry, very unusual in those days. But my mother had studied Latin, and she discovered that I was using my memory and I didn't know Latin. And by this time I was with Roach in class four. And so she took it upon herself to come down here to meet with Mr. Roach. And she came home and told me, she said, Clifton, I went to visit school. Really? Yes, she said, I visited Mr. Roach. And I told him you did not know Latin and you were just using your memory. And Roach said, really? <laughs> you have to realize Roach would call upon each student in turn. You made a mistake, down you would go with a zero and you go through the whole room. And as Mike <laughs> and Ben Sobel know, because of our, we were S's and W's, I was in the last row. And I always hoped that the class would not, would end before it got to my room. <laughs> And so I, I said, well, you, you went to see him? She said, yes, and I told him. Said, and he told me, he said, well, Mrs. Ward, from now on, I'm going to call on Clifton first, every single class, <laughs> and send you a note home and tell you how he did. I was aghast, absolutely aghast. Now, many years later, when I gave a, a, the inaugural address here, I told this story. And one of my classmates came up and said, Bill Roach is still alive. I said, really, yes. So I sent him a copy of the speech, and he wrote me back a beautiful letter, which is in the book, and so on. But that's the experience that I had with Roach. But I had many others. Uh, I could mention a quite a few. I have several in the book. I mentioned Craig, who was a wonderful teacher. Max Levine, that everybody loved, who was up here on the phrase. Max taught French, and let me tell you, he never missed having a class that exceeded the requirements for language in college. Every single class. Just like that. And those of you who couldn't remember Max Levine, he always started that class with that large blackboard, and he had all the irregular verbs, irregular verbs written on it, and he would say, the words that one must begin with are avoir and être. You know? <laughs> but the important thing for me about Boston Latin was, besides the companionship and comradeship with my classmates, was the fact that the curriculum was a curriculum which gave you the opportunity to learn how to think. In a variety of ways, you were encouraged to use your mind and learn how to think and learn how to learn. And that was invaluable for me. And quite frankly, uh, I've said this to a couple of people today, the attitude that I have towards Latin school is rooted in the fact that also Many of my classmates went to Harvard along with me. We had the largest number of Boston Latin School graduates that year compared to Andover. We beat them in Andover. And that, those classmates of mine, we were together for six years at here at Boston Latin, four years at Harvard. We went from pre-adolescence, adolescence, and adulthood together. And we became permanent friends. One other Latin school story, and then we'll move on. Um, perhaps many of you don't realize that along with the scholarship that he talks about, Cliff was an outstanding athlete in track. In fact, when he first came back to this building, the, ba the basement corridor, which we have renovated, was the track. That's where all of us used to run around. I still remember seven times around is a mile, in case anybody wants to try it. <laughs> there is a portion in the book 
there's a part in the book where Cliff recalls his senior year. There was a first class runner at English High School who dominated the entire season. Doherty. Doherty. <laughs> See, I know. Doherty. And then <laughs> Cliff and Doherty faced off in the regimentals. And I believe it's one of the few times that your dad was in the stand. So tell the story about the track well, meet. I, I, there's, there's an additional note to this. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, Court Ellis, who was here, uh, was a friend of mine for many, many years. And Court was at English High, and I was at Boston Latin. But we still remained good friends. And that year, Doherty kept getting higher, uh, better time than I did in, my, in the 220. And it be soon became apparent that we were going to clash in the regimentals. And I never will forget it. Court kept needling me and saying, you think Doherty's going to beat you? You think Doherty's going to beat you? Actually, he really wanted me to win. Didn't you, Court? I'm sure you did. But, <laughs> but the thing that happened was that when you are running in a race, you don't hear anything. You, your really mind is concentrating. And we took off. Doherty was ahead of me. First turn, second turn, back stretch, next turn. And we got to the last turn, and he was about five yards ahead of me. And for the first time, my only time in my life, I heard someone. It was my father. And he yelled at me, said, go get him, Cliff. And I burst out, passed him on the inside, and beat him. <laughs> and of course, Court was very happy. I was happy. <laughs> my father was happy. But I did that to Doherty every year, every, every race the rest of the year. But that was, that was one of my great fun zones. But Court and I set a high school high jump record jointly, same height. Together. And we had our picture taken in the audience. There you go. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the four years at Harvard. That was a very interesting period because uh, at first uh, I was a commuter, like many other students from Boston. Then I entered uh, uh, Adam's house, and one of my roommates, uh, Harold May, is here. I might point out that. Um, one of the interesting things of that particular period is that in terms of Harvard and many of the other elite colleges and universities, they had very limited numbers of blacks that were admitted. In my class at Harvard, there were only four of us. Keep in mind that that's the same number that was in my father's class at Boston University many years before. There was a restriction. And the result was it was not because there was no there was no affirmative action, there was no special admit. You were admitted on the basis of your intellectual ability. And so as a result, many of the students would see you there, they would assume you had to be bright. It wasn't that you were given a special up. You were there because of it. But I did not experience too many difficulties in terms of race at that time. There were occasions. My greatest difficulty in that period, though, was when I left Harvard to join Tuskegee Airmen to become a pilot. And then I was in the South, and I could go through a lot of stories on that. And that's when I really encountered absolutely vicious kinds of racism uh, while I was a cadet at Tuskegee. Tell the story about going through the uh, induction oh. center, if you will. Um, I, was, uh, I was sworn in at Fort Devens. Traveled down to Biloxi, Mississippi. I had never been to Biloxi, Mississippi before. And uh, those of us who were going to Tuskegee were processed separately, blacks in one group, whites in another. And each of us had a big, large manila envelope in which was contained, which contained our data, information about ourselves, which was filled out at the time we entered, enrolled. But we never saw what was on the form. We never saw it. But every time you went to a new base, you had to tarry it with you, and they would check the form and go on. Well, we arrived there, and I'm going through this process. And my form goes down, goes down, and suddenly it stops. And a white sergeant said, whose is this? And I said, mine. He just gave him my name. He said, where did you have this filled out? I said, Fort Devens. He said, 
you can get court martial for lying on your forms. And I was, here I was, three days in the Air, Air Army. I had no insane, I was just as new as you could be. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And he got more and more excited. And finally, a lieutenant who was in the well in back of him, hearing this commotion, he got up and came over. He said, Sergeant, what's the problem? And the sergeant said, well, this recruit here, I knew what he wanted to say. He, he said, this recruit, he said, has falsified his forms. He cannot speak all these languages, been to all these countries, and is a junior at Harvard. And he was only 18 years old. And the lieutenant said, you went to Harvard? I said, yes, sir. He said, did you live in the dorms? I said, yes, sir. Adam's house. He said, how is Dr. Little these days? And Dr. Little was the headmaster of God at Adam's. And he said to the sergeant, this is perfectly all right. It's correct. And he threw it down the table. But I had some other ones, too. That were we'll get to some of those. Yeah. yeah. Let's uh, move into uh, uh, a different uh, frame of reference here, if you will. How are you able to segue into four entirely different careers, from philanthropy to higher ed to business and government? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the men in particular, it was a case of it's much more natural than you would realize at first. Uh, my first position, uh, the job, was with Nelson Rockefeller, working in one of his programs dealing with Latin America and e economic development. We had programs in Venezuela, Brazil, and Costa Rica. And I was a trainee, and then I was in charge of information. This was after I'd graduated with a master's from Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, where I was the first black enrolled there in segregated Washington. That's another story. But uh, I, at that time, found the area of international development quite interesting. My father wanted me to become a diplomat, and I had planned on being a diplomat, but for a variety of reasons, I said, no, I don't want to do that. And I said to my father, I said, you know, I think that foreign economic development is going to be a very important part of US foreign policy. And my father, who is kind of an old conservative in this regard, said, oh, that's just do-goodism. And I said, no, I think it's going to be very important, which it turned out to be. And that's how I became employed by Nelson Rockefeller. But I was there for five years and became married. We had a son. And I said, I didn't see too much future in that regard. And I had two wonderful bosses. And one of them one day said, you know, Cliff, he said, I think you should get your PhD. I hadn't thought about it, but you should do so. And Dolores and I talked about it. And I said, well, it might be something we should consider. Then that same person one day gave me a new journal, professional journal, called Economic Development and Cultural Change, which was just being issued by the University of Chicago. And my, my mentor there said, you know, Cliff, he said, uh, I could, you might go back to Harvard, but I don't think that would be a good idea. You could go to Wisconsin and get institutional economics. But Chicago, now there is a place where they've got huge econometrics and very wonderful statistical economics, and that would be a good place for you. Well, this journal was being published in Chicago, so he said, read this. So I went home and I read this. In the journal, there was an article by a professor named Theodore Schultz. I didn't know who he was. I read this journal, it was really very congested. Two days later, I'm in the office, and he calls me and he says, Cliff, come in, I want you to meet somebody. And I come in and say, here's Professor Theodore Schultz. Now, I did not know it at the time, but Schultz was getting ready to start a major study of US technical assistance in Latin America, which is where I've been working. And he was recruiting Maddox to be part of that mission. And he, I told him, I said, Dr. Schultz, oh, I read that article. He goes, I didn't understand a word of it. He said, I've been told that before. <laughs> and it turned out that he was, he was able to have, he wanted me to come to Chicago as his research assistant, what? Working on the project on technical assistance, which ultimately led to my PhD dissertation. And through that, I became a PhD. It was the first black PhD from Chicago. But then one of the mission members was another wonderful man named Mark Mosher, 
who became head of a new organization of John D. Rockefeller III. And before I had finished my dissertation, he said, I need you to come and work with me. Can you give me a hand? He fixed it so that I could work on my dissertation, and I came back to the Rockefellers, this time with John D. Rockefeller III. There, I was working on problems of agriculture and economic development in Asia, not Latin America. Then, I, Dolores and I spent six years in Southeast Asia, and then I came back to the States to head up a program, which was a new program created by Mosher, to provide research grants to young faculty who had not had an opportunity to work abroad. And so I was the person who took it all around to different campuses, had workshops, seminars, met faculty, deans, and department chairs, and so on. Now, back in the United States, because of my work overseas and my research, I became a member of the State Department Committee on East Asia. I became a member of the Asian Society, all these organizations. And I became well known. So suddenly I began to get inquiries about becoming a department chairman. And then I got some inquiries about university presidencies. And Dolores and I said, really? I said, I had not thought about that because I was destined to become head of the foundation that I was with. So the first one, the very interesting one which came along was the University of Michigan, believe it or not. And so Dolores and I went out for the interviews and so on. But I didn't think that was the right property for me. Then a year later, Michigan State calls. And they said, and I studied them. I said, ah, this is a place where I really would be able to do a lot of the things that I'd be interested in, be able to do work on it. And so that's how I came to Michigan State for higher education. Then we were there for eight years through all the trauma of riots, students' demonstrations, budget cuts, all that. And I was approached by several universities for about other presidencies until I was approached by the State University of New York, which has 64 colleges and universities. So talked to Dolores again, and I said, let's go. So we accepted that. And I was there, we were there for nine years. And it turns out that uh, part of the reason why they wanted me was that I had managed a, the second largest university in the United States, and I had acquired a experience as a faculty member, an academic, and then it turned out that TIA CREF, which is a largely a pension fund for faculty in higher education and education, and it turned out they would like me to come and become their chairman and CEO. And I was the first outsider hired by them to run it back. So that's how each of these sequences, now keep in mind, there's a, there's a thread through this, which is education in terms of that, plus the activity that was my primary interest was in developing human capital, whether it was in Latin America, Southeast Asia, Michigan State. It, it was always focused on human capital. I want to take, I want to take us back to 1969-70 when Dolores and you were thinking about moving on to Michigan State. If I remember my history, um, Lyndon Johnson a few years earlier had passed significant legislation, um, civil rights legislation. Uh, there had been assassinations. There had been um, riots in Detroit, I think in 67, 68. Uh, Boston was still trying to deal with some of those concerns. It blew up a little bit later, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and here you both come into East Lansing and are faced with a number of issues. Uh, the biggest being, how do you act as a president if the whole university is blowing up? Uh, there doesn't appear to be a manual, at least I haven't been able to no. find find one yet. So tell us a little bit about the, the, the uh, uh, environment, if you will, uh, at, at, uh, at Michigan State at the time you, you both started. Right. Well, it, it was, uh, I would have to say it was, in many ways, um, going to Michigan State was a significant 
and dramatic change in one regard, which was that my previous pioneering in different positions was sort of below the radar. When I became president of Michigan State University, it was all the newspapers all over the United States, front page of the New York Times, photograph, and so on. I had, I had two television crews backed up in the corridor in the office. I mean, it was just, and they never let up for at least what, about a year, a year and a half. We were, we were on view all the time, 24 hours a day. And that was a big change because it meant that we had to learn how to deal with intrusions on privacy, intrusions on us. It sounds strange, but it's true. Um, I was elected president by a five to three vote. <coughs> three, there were three, de three trustees who didn't want me to be president. They wanted the former governor of Michigan, Sophie Williams, to be president. And so they did not want me. And I have to tell you, every month we had a board meeting, those men did their best to try to get rid of me. As a matter of fact, before I even arrived on campus, I met with them, and they said, don't unpack. We're going to get you out of here. That, that's how you start, just before you even get to the question of demonstrations. So I had an environment in which I had to be particularly careful, because as the first black, I knew I had to do it as well as I could, but I also had to maintain the university protected, et cetera. Second thing, and by the way, in terms of intrusion in personal life, I mean, I don't mind telling you a number of stories, but one of them, which I think is really kind of telling, before Delor, I guess before Dolores Never arrived, the then acting president hosted a reception for us in the president's house. And uh, we were there greeting them, getting to know people. And suddenly Dolores noticed that our son Bruce was missing. And Bruce was, what, nine, I guess, at that time. And we couldn't, she couldn't find him. And then she heard voices downstairs in the basement. She goes down there, and here were these three dissident trustees pumping our nine-year-old son to get information about our private life. You know, this is that, like that. We had reporters that would show up in this school, wanting to follow him around school to see how the students reacted to a black student in the class. The principal called the Lord and said, did you get permission? He said, no. He said, come out. I mean, this was, it's a, con people don't realize that that's the kind of environment. Secondly, because of the high visibility, we also knew that there were questions being raised about whether she and I were competent to be able to deal with this. Now, remember, this was a campus of 48,000 students. It had the largest dormitory complex of any university in the United States. It was the second largest university in the United States. The campus was five miles north and south, a mile and a half east and west, one huge monster. As a matter of fact, I tell in the book the story that when we went there on our first visit, I rented a car to drive back to the airport. I got lost on the campus. And the Lord said, why don't you stop and ask somebody? I said, not in your life. <laughs> I can see the headlines now. New president loses way on campus. You know what I mean? No, but that's, yeah. Now the third thing is, there was a great obvious concern about whether or not my presence would lead to a lessening of the quality of the university. Because there was a tremendous problem of open admissions then in the United States, which I call the revolving door. They increased the number of minority admissions, but they didn't graduate. They just on the door. And so I had to develop a, an approach to reassure both the minorities and the non-minorities as to what I wanted to have done. So I did it with a special commission, which studied the matter, and they came out with a series of recommendations, which are in the book. And the recommendations involved developing special, one of the recommendations was to develop special programs for incoming students based upon whether there was an educational disadvantagement or economic disadvantagement, and to give them special treatment before they even enrolled as freshmen. And, I, and they would, very often I would be approached, they'd say, we want a quota, we want a number, we want a number. I would not give them a number. I said, we're going to admit 
and graduate and gradually increase. When we began this program, by the time that program, the first group graduated, they had the exact same graduation rate as the rest of the campus. And we had the largest number of minority students in the United States. But I never wanted to do it the other way. It was possible to do it. Mm -hmm. But I was able to anticipate what was going to happen. But then, fourthly, with the riots and demonstrations, we had the first riot six weeks after we arrived. Six weeks. In the snow in February. And the <laughs> they were tearing up the town and part of the campus. And the head of public safety on campus came over to the Cole's house, the president's house. And he said, I think, President Wharton, you should go out and speak to the students. OK, says I. So Dolores and I and our oldest son, Clifton, had come on a visit, which is another story, because Clifton is, uh, or was, uh, six feet four. He looked like he was wearing his peace jacket and his long hair and the whole thing. He looked just like the other campus students. He came for a visit. He was a senior in high school. And he could not get on campus because of the mobs and the police. Mm -hmm. So he had to, but Dolores couldn't meet him at the airport. She said, just take a taxi. So he took a taxi. Taxi couldn't get on campus. Clifton gets out of the taxi, goes out to a campus policeman. He says, where's the president's house? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I know. No. She said, Clifton said, well, I'm the president's son. He said, yeah, I know. He said, let me see your ID. So he gave him his ID. He said, you are the president's son. <laughs> because he's named the same as mine. But, but he was with us. And he, the, police, the head of police took us to the student union, which was about as far from this corner over to there. We didn't even know where it was. I mean, they, we were standing on the snow. And, uh, they gave me a bullhorn, and Gloris was beside me. And uh, I didn't know how to use a bullhorn. You know, you think you don't. So finally, I learned. I said, students admit I was very academic. Students of Michigan State, these activities are highly counterproductive. <laughs> and a yell goes up, up yours, Wharton. I mean, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so I decided, so a football player said, let him talk. I talked. Said, I talked to different things. Then I went back. They went right back on line. I get home, and Laura says, she looked at me. At the look I knew. What did you get us to do? <laughs> but anyway. It was, a, it was a fabulous opportunity, a great experience, mainly because we were in a situation where that campus has some very special qualities. And by the time we left, we had a great relationship throughout the whole system and the state of Michigan. And so much so that after we had left, they named that Performing Arts Center for the two of us which is another story, because Dolores was the one who pushed that. And, and a lot of the stories around the Michigan State years are in the book. But I would suggest that uh, you mentioned the 5-3 vote. Yes. Uh, those of us who have been superintendents, if you get a 5-3 vote, it's time to polish your resume. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move on. OK. Um, in terms of uh, trans, uh, Moving from Michigan State to SUNY, the challenges that you addressed there, uh, how were they different? How were they similar? Uh, what did you find when, obviously, you went there at a critical juncture at the, at, with, the, with the state uh, system? Uh, disjointed would be probably a, a correct term to use. Tell us a little bit about uh, why the challenge, if you will, and then what did you find? And well, the, the, the university, SUNY, had been built up very largely as a result of Nelson Rockefeller. It was his pride baby. And, um, but by this time, the state levels of funding and support were declining. It was an aggregation of former teachers' colleges, some brand new research universities, community colleges, medical schools, and so on. As I used to say, every single field of knowledge is taught somewhere in the SUNY system. And there's a campus within 50 miles of every resident. And so what happened was, here was a huge, the largest system in the United States. But 
It was disjointed, as you say. It was suffering from decline in terms of funding. And uh, you would see in the book that one of my patterns of behavior is what I call a shipboard tour. Because when I was a youngster going on board my first ships, I always went from the bridge down to the engine room. I didn't know where everything was. And I'm very curious. And so at Michigan, at SUNY, what I did was I visited all 64 campuses in 10 months. I got to know where the campuses were, what their problems were, and so on. But from that, I developed a template of my priority issues. And if you were to look at what I did and presented to the Board of Trustees, that represented all of my activities for the next nine years. But one of the things that I wanted to do was to make it more consciously aware of being a part of a system. Secondly, was to show them that by being a system and working as together, they would have more power and influence than otherwise. And the perfect example of that was when uh, the governor, the then governor, Kerry, had cut the budget so dramatically that we would have had major, major problems with the university. And with the concurrence of the board, the trustees, I decided that we would try to, re to overturn his veto of the budget. It had never been done for 25 years. And working with the campuses and throughout the whole state, we did it. We overran it. And afterwards, one of the uh, university presidents, a woman, came up to me and she said, you proved to us that being a system works. Yeah. Now, there were other things that I wanted to accomplish, which was giving them greater flexibility in administration. Uh, this was an over-regulated university. But there are lots of other things that I found. But to me, the major challenges there were the ones of trying to give it some greater substance, greater excellence, and build this institution in a way that made it really coherent and also effective in terms of their achievements. It's somewhat similar to, if I may use an example from secondary education, there is constant talk around developing school districts that offer a portfolio of options, meaning that historically the model that was developed may be in a different age, the industrial age, where you have a central office and a, um, a set of schools and everything pretty much walks the same way, that everything is either top-down and hierarchical and whatever. The, the notion that exists now is how do you create, instead of a school system, a system of schools mm -hmm. where you differentiate yeah, yeah. as much flexibility and autonomy mm -hmm. and translate that into governance right. as well yeah. at the local level, while at the same time uh, integrating the yeah. system's approach right. so that they're not all running amok. Right. And right now, that's the major challenge that you see, I think, anyways, yeah. at the secondary level. Right. Talk a little bit about transitioning to TIA CREF and <laughs> a couple of the uh, examples of what you uh, uh, were faced with and how you turned it around. Yeah. Well, uh, TIA CREF, uh, when I went there, was the largest private pension fund in the country. And its customer base were primarily people in academia and colleges and universities and also the private, uh, private K-12. Um, it was a, a pension system that gave you a report on your accumulations once a year. Once you put your money in, you could never get it out except as an annuity. Now, meanwhile, mutual funds were festering, festering, because they wanted to attack T.I. Cref, and they wanted it and they clearly, gradually had an impact on universities saying, well, we don't have enough choices, we don't have enough options, et cetera. And um, what a lot of people didn't realize, of course, except the board did, I had been on the board of directors of Equitable Life, the insurance company. And T.I. Cref is an insurance company. And as a matter of fact, uh, this is another thing about pioneering. When I went on the board of Equitable Life, I was the second black to become a corporate director in the United States. People don't realize that was in 1969. Amazing how short a time it is. But what I did was I 
uh, decided that I needed to move very quickly. And so I created a special uh, future agenda commission made up of the board of trustees, the board of overseers, plus the top staff. And we worked on this, trying to achieve greater flexibility for TIA CREF in terms of what it was doing. And we moved so quickly that uh, several of the trustees said they'd never seen anybody make these quick to change. But it would enable us to have more choices, enable the people to access their money. I knew, I thought I knew, that what the objection was was not that they couldn't get the money out, but they had no option to get it out. And so some of my predecessors were very upset with uh, my making these changes. But what happened was, as soon as we put the effective changes in, there was a four-tenths of 1% outflow. And I said, I told the people, I said, see, it isn't that they wanted to move, they just wanted it in case they needed the money to move out. But we built up a whole approach. We had a lot of activities of improving quality of service. We had a series of activities relating to building up better relationships with the campuses. We had a range of activities that we did. And it was also uh, the structure, the governance of the system was very antiquated. There was a series of silos which didn't talk to each other. Uh, one of the things, <laughs> this sounds minor, but it's very critical. Again, it's my shipboard tours. I visited, soon after I arrived, I visited every floor in the three buildings that we were in and all the employees. And when I finished, I said to the man in charge of the buildings, I said, I know which department's giving you the greatest difficulty because we were having a huge turnover rate in the company. And that meant that we had such a high turnover rate that it was equivalent to changing the workforce every three years. I said, I know which departments are the worst. I told him, he said, how did you know that? I said, I wouldn't want to work there. So I changed the pattern, changed the tree, and I gave them some opportunity to see how it was. They didn't have, they didn't have what I thought was an adequate personnel system. So there was Tina Horner sitting there. I hired Matina to come over and start a whole new system in the pest office. Each time it was trying to improve what was being done on an old timey basis to more modern in terms of, and it just blossomed. And I, when I left in six, in six years, I doubled the assets. Okay. Uh, I see that very little has changed around here. That banging you hear, uh, Bill Hennessy would know what that is. It's a typical heating unit in a Boston public school. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that we've spent probably over $100 million in this facility over the years trying to fix the infrastructure. You can see we haven't been very successful. We move on. Okay. Uh, we t you talked a little bit about the, the incident at uh, uh, Tuskegee. Um, there are a couple of others that I think are, uh, now that you look back on them, probably uh, somewhat humorous, but they weren't at the time. Um, obviously, the book is titled um, Privilege and Prejudice. You were obviously, a, as, a, as has been mentioned, a quiet pioneer in all of the things that you've done, which implies a great deal of talent and knowledge and whatever, yet you talk about moving into the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies at Johns Hopkins, where again you were a pioneer, and running into uh, evidence of racism, if you will. So tell a little bit about the, um, the story at the Willard, oh. which uh, <laughs> uh, I think folks will uh, uh, get a, 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 a big hoot out of primarily because it links to some of the things that you were doing at TIA Craft. Right. Well, the, uh, Mike is referring to the fact that, uh, I'll back up a bit. Uh, when I was at Harvard, um, I was involved in the founding of the National Student Association. And we had a, a group that was organized to prepare for it, and I was secretary of that group. So I was secretary of the founding convention. And we had a president and a vice president and a treasurer. And they're actually one of the pictures that's up there is the four of us on that. 
And the president, during the time I was secretary, married his college sweetheart, and they came on a honeymoon to Washington, D.C. And there I was at SICE, the School of Advanced International Studies, which was in one building, the dormitories, dining room, library, classrooms, all in one building. And although Washington was segregated, I was still in this segregated situation. For the first couple of months, um, certain of the students, if I sat down in the meeting, eating room with them, would get up and leave. Okay. But it was so bad, in fact, that when we didn't, we used to have to go out to eat on weekends. And some of my classmates boycotted any restaurant that would not take me. Very interesting. But my friends from NSA, the National Student Association, they come to Washington, and they call me up and said, Cliff, we're at the Willard Hotel. Come on down, and we'll go out to dinner. I said, great. So I forgot that I was in segregated Washington. So I go to the hotel, go to the phone, call. They weren't in the room. So I sat down in the lobby. Oi, no, 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 no. All the looks, who are you? The clerk comes around, comes over to me and says, who are you? What are you doing here? And he starts throwing me out of the hotel. And just then, my friends come through this revolving door, grab me, and they see what was happening, took me out. Now, the point of the story is this. When I became chairman and CEO of GI Craft, the Withered Hotel had been closed for a number of years. But to reopen, they needed $50, $20 million. I go to my first real estate meeting, and I look at the agenda, and guess what? It's $20 million for the Willard Hotel. <laughs> and I said to the I officers, I said, this is the hotel that tried to throw me out because I was black. And we paid it. We, we you know, get off. But to me, that was an example both of what can happen, but also the progress that can be. But it's not perfect by any means yet. But that was, a, that was a great one for me. I said, we got you. Yeah. There you go. What goes around comes around, right. I guess right. that's what. Yeah. Um, finally, in, in dealing with uh, a couple of other major areas, um, you obviously, during the time that we've just discussed, the time period, you served a number of presidents, as Lynn mentioned earlier. A lot of commissions, lots of things that you uh, were engaged in, but it wasn't until uh, the Clinton administration that uh, you decided, after you were asked, to come on as Deputy Secretary of State. I've heard it from a very good source that uh, it was probably the only time that um, Dolores suggested that that might not be in your best interest. You see how far we've probed on these things, you see. So tell us a little bit about, obviously, um, uh, I hate to say this, but it appears that Dolores was right on target. Um, she always is. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, talk a little bit about uh, why the decision to go, and then a little bit about how you've mentioned, not only in the book, but to me, um, Washington has somewhat changed a bit. Yeah. Well, um, by way of background, um, I was uh, approached by um, both President Carter and President Reagan for cabinet posts. And each time I said no, I wasn't interested. And my reasons were different. Uh, for example, with Carter, it was the fact that as president of a major public university, I always argued that the dollars that I received were not Republican dollars, it was Democratic dollars. So I didn't want to get into a, an issue of, of partisanship. Reagan was a different question. Um, the um, issue with uh, Clinton was that Dolores and I were invited to go out to the Wharton Center where President Clinton's, one of the debates was being held during the election. <coughs> and I would have to say I was quite impressed with Clinton's performance at that. After he was elected, but before he took office, he had a gathering in, in, uh, in Arkansas 
of about 250 people, huge group, where they came from all walks of life, businessmen, politicians, etc. And several of us were asked to speak. I was on a particular panel. And I watched uh, Gore and Clinton operate. Clinton had a, both of them had a briefing books about that thick. They never consulted it. They would exchange ideas and thoughts and programs with the pe people who were talking. They, they knew them immediately very well. I was tremendously impressed with the depth of knowledge that both men had. When I appeared on my panel, um, I made a set of closing remarks, and the whole audience cheered and so on. So they thought it was very good, I guess. At any rate, um, then um, Vernon Jordan <laughs> saw me one time, and he said, you ought to think about joining Clinton's administration. They're going to need help like yours. I said, well, you know, I wasn't so sure. Well, it turned out that he did approach me. And um, the, uh, the first one item I was not interested in. But then he said, well, what about the number two position at the Department of State? And I thought that this was a place where I might be able to be helpful. Because that is primarily a management position. It's not a foreign policy position. And Dolores and I talked about it, and you're right. Dolores was not overly enthusiastic about this one. She had dealt with Washington for a lot through her corporate boards and a lot of people from Washington. But in this particular case, I had not realized the changes that had taken place in Washington. When I chaired various commissions in Washington, one of them I used to go to Washington every, every month, and I would go to Congress. And the leadership in both houses was such that they would debate on the floor, disagree, but then they would get together and talk and work it out mm -hmm. by compromise and negotiation. So that, for example, I could go to see Senator Javits and I could go to see Humphrey. It, it, it would make no difference. I mean, they would work it there. Well, I stopped going for about 10 years, and I had not realized how badly that it had deteriorated. And I first realized this when I was in Washington working on a report on how do we organize foreign assistance, which was one of the responsibilities I had. And they wanted to prevent me from taking the draft report to the two committees and the leadership and the minority leadership. And I said, do you want to get this change or not? Because if you know politics, and as I did, you talk to both parties. You don't just talk to one. And they said, no, they're the enemy. And I described uh, several instances in the book of how it was so, it was terrible, I mean, what they're working with. So that particular change was very, very dramatic. It's worse now than it was then. Mm -hmm. And it is a serious, serious problem. Because it means that instead of being political, in low P, it's political with a capital P to what's happening. Last question, um, and it has to do with something that you've talked about both publicly and privately to, to, to me, and that is the escalating costs of higher education. Uh, particularly, I think, if I remember it correctly, you've made a statement that if you're in the highest economic uh, level, you have pretty much an 85 or somewhere around there percent chance of moving on. If you're in the lowest quartile, it's probably 8%. The gap gets continuously larger. Um, how do you see this uh, in terms of providing the kind of opportunity, we call it an open gate around here as part of the Latin school tradition, so that generations of students who uh, really have aspirations uh, can actually engage in whatever is necessary to move along. Yeah, yeah this, this is, a, as you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very hot topic in my, my makeup. Um, first and foremost, uh, what has worried me most 
is the, what I would call the change in prioritization of funding of higher education and education generally. And the best example I have in the book is when I went to Michigan State, student tuition paid for one third of the cost of education. Two thirds came from the state and federal government. Today, it's flipped. It's 27%. Mm -hmm. it, it's amazing. Now, and I talk about this as the negative impact of eating your own seed corn. Because for me, higher education particularly, is the source of the development of new knowledge in an environment which promotes achievement and which indeed creates human capital. And many universities now are suffering in a variety of ways where they skimp on this, they skip on that. It's not just the roads that are going to be, there's other things happening in universities. And what worried me is that it's because the general public priority, it's dropping. Now, the tuition is going up, yes, but it's been going up offsetting these losses. And the point that you are making about the study, which I cited in the book, is that if you're in the top quartile of income in a family, 85% chance of your children going to college. If you're in the bottom quartile, it's 8%, 8%. These are not just inner city, it's also rural area. And what happens is, this to me represents a huge loss of human capital. These are individuals who might have the opportunity to make significant contributions, who could, by the opportunity, be able to go and make a contribution to human capital. They're just wiping it out. Now, there are causes, there's institutional racism, there's a whole series of issues that are creating it, and persistently. And I must confess that the, uh, my reaction, which is uh, very visceral on this one, right now the debate that's taking place in the presidential debates, where they're talking about, arguing about free college, all right, free college. And there's one person, I won't name him, who came out with the statement and said, Free tuition would be the decimation of the American state, United States. And I said to the floor, I said, this person never heard of GI Bill. You stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. Those of us who had here were in GI Bill, the number of people, the number of people who had an educational opportunity to go to college in those years produced incredible increases in the United States capital, huge. Huge productivity. And free, yeah. It was veterans, yes. Mm -hmm. But the, the campuses exploded in size. They, all these activities. Who is it that benefited? Now, here's where the real catch comes. And I used to do, when I was a, a so-called economist in Chicago, there are studies which have been done which shows that Individuals benefit from their education, and you can calculate it. But there's a portion of the increase in value which is not received by the individual. It's received by the state. So if part of the value of education is for the individual, there's another part that's valuable for the state. So, so don't you pay for it? No, 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 no. It should be free. <laughs> I mean, this, this is where it seems to me we are missing the boat on prioritization and also on the effect of that loss of human capital and also the effect of this on eating your seed corn. Well, we've, uh, the hour has gone by quickly. Um, I hope uh, you all have, uh, as I have, having uh, read the book and gone through a series of conversations and with both Dolores and Cliff, get an appreciation of what the term quiet pioneer means. Uh, there's a tremendous legacy here and a tremendous message that can be sent to young people, and particularly young people who may not feel that the system works for them. And so by writing this, not only do we have an oral history, which we have uh, recorded, but we have a written history. And so uh, I want to thank you for uh, 
asking Latin school to be the last stop on this book tour. The last shall be first. That's true, <laughs> that's true. And I want to uh, end by suggesting we are indeed honored and privileged to have such a distinguished alumnus and an honored son of the Boston Latin School. Thank so you. with that, thank you.